Good morning, everybody. How are you guys doing? I guess they had no one else, huh? Back to back. Wonderful. Very wonderful. It's not going to be as polished as I would hope it was, but it's okay. Um, so what book am I, am I preaching about? Ah, yes. Good, 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 good. Cool. All right. Who's up there? Is that C? Oh, my gosh. Well, what's up, bro? I haven't seen you forever. Okay. Um, okay. The Book of Romans. Uh, so, just a, a quick, quick, brief, brief uh, reminder of, of what we went over last week. Uh, the Book of Romans. Who was it written by? Paul. Who was it written to? The Romans. Okay. Uh, had Paul met the Romans yet? No. Um, this is a book, this is a letter that was written to them, not out of, not out of anger, not out of uh, frustration with them, more so just encouraging them in their faith and, and wanting to, to evangelize them. He hadn't had the honor of evangelizing to them in person. Um, so, this book is about who? It's, 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 a, it's a book that's dedicated to who? God. Well, yeah, wait, Romans, yeah, but sorry. It's about God, God himself, okay? This, if you want to learn who God is, what our relationship with him should be and is, um, it's about him. It's about God's righteousness and about man's sin. Uh, so that's, that's the book of Romans. So last week we went over verses 1 to 15, and logically, you would assume I would be going over 16 to 32 this week, but we're only going to go over verses 16 and 17. It's two verses, um, and these are really big verses, actually. So it's gonna, it, that's why it takes a lot. Uh, it takes one sermon. It could actually take a, a good number of sermons just to go over these. But um, So, yes, open your Bibles up to Romans 1, and we're going to be going over 16 and 17. And let me get an amen when you guys are there. All righty. Uh, yes, fresh water. Okay. The Word of God says, we read it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Word of God says this, verse 16. Oh, okay, remember, remember, sorry, sorry, just a quick reminder, remember. So Paul left off here where he was saying that he wanted to visit them so eagerly. He wanted to, to evangelize to them. He wanted to, to, to preach the gospel to them in person. And he, he was so eager to. And then he says this, For I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 17. For in it, for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Okay. Now, why would Paul feel the need? Why would he feel the need to write that he is not ashamed of this gospel? We think about the gospel. We think about our faith uh, in this present day, and being ashamed of this message is, is somewhat, somewhat normal nowadays. Um, you know, did, did Paul, so did Paul know, did Paul know that a good thousand years later that we were going to be ashamed of this gospel? Maybe he did, but we don't know for certain. That's not why he's writing it. He can't, he can't really look into the future. He can't see the future. But he wrote it, he wrote this, this sentence right here, I am not ashamed, because why wouldn't, why wouldn't someone be ashamed of the gospel in the first century? Okay, why wouldn't someone be ashamed in Paul's time in Rome? Well, not in Rome, but, but in Paul's time. So let's do a bit of background. Remember, Christianity, our religion, in Paul's time, was brand new. It was brand new. This gospel was brand, brand new to the public. Okay? 
It was a brand new religion. It was a brand new teaching, a new concept, a new faith. It was, even, it was even a new God. It was a new God that they were preaching, right? That Christ is God. So it's a new God that they were preaching. And the Christians of, of the first church, right, the, 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 the early church, were, looked, they were, were so looked down upon, right? They were looked down upon even more than us in this present day. Even more than us, believe it or not. So Paul, Paul and, and, and the early church were surrounded by, by Jews, and who else? Gentiles. Yes, Jews and Gentiles. Jews and, and non-Jewish people. Jews and, and, and Greeks, mostly. Um, and, you know, you had, you had these pagan Gentiles, these people who did not believe in, in, in one God or, or in anything. You had, you had them think of, of Christians as atheists, right? Because we didn't believe in their gods or in the gods that they, they, they were teaching about. So they, they viewed us as atheists. And then you had the Jewish people, you had them think of us as heretics, as liars, as crazy people preaching about this false god, right? This new Messiah, right? Who they didn't view as the Messiah. So, um, you know, they, they, just, they just viewed us as filthy sinners, right? Living a lie, preaching a lie. Now, Paul, what was Paul's original name? Saul. Yes, Saul. Now Saul was a reputable man. He was a, good, he was a, a scholar. He was a great Jewish uh, scholar. This, this man, he was a Pharisee, and he, he studied the law to the T. I mean, this man was the law, per se. He loved it, and he was zealous over it. He was so passionate over it. He would kill Christians over this law, right? Um, so Paul, Paul was respected by his peers. Paul had already set up a reputation for himself, right? He was a good man. He was very intelligent. He could keep up with the philosophers of that day, too. They, they, they respected him uh, for the intellect that he was. So, out of nowhere, this zealot, this respectable man, this intelligent man, right, starts going on and spewing about, he's moving on to this so-called gospel of a man called Jesus of Nazareth. Of Nazareth? You're saying that this man, who's Paul, has given up such, such status, right? He abandoned his intellect to follow a man from the hood, from the projects of their time, from Nazareth? I mean, what kind of, what, what's, he's, he lost it. This man has lost it. That's how, that's how they're reviewing Paul. This man has lost it. How are you going to be talking about a man that's from Nazareth? That's a saying, I don't know. I'm not, maybe you guys, I don't want to say the city and you guys are from there and like, you know, I don't know. But just from the, from the projects or something, you know, not, you know, but, but that's how people view, sadly, you know, those, those places. And so Nazareth to them was like, was like the, the slums. It was the, it was the hood. It was where all, you know, you had all the ghetto people over there, right? And, and they didn't respect Jesus' parents, right? You had a carpenter as a father, you know, for them, that was just like, that's nothing, you know? So, Paul had abandoned his intellect, his everything, you know, his status to follow a man that was from the projects. That's embarrassing to them, you know. So, um, and not only that, Christians from, from, from the first century, were const we were constantly mocked. We were constantly criticized, ridiculed, right? They laughed, they, they, they roasted us. They roasted us for basing our faith on a man who was crucified. They laughed at us for following a man that was crucified. A man that cru uh, dying by, by, the, by crucifixion is such an embarrassment. It is the worst punishment ever. It's for like the worst people, the worst. It's humiliating. So, so to us, to, in their eyes, they're like, these guys are promoting a man who was crucified? Are you kidding me? Not only that, people didn't believe in the resurrection. And people didn't, so you had Greeks who, first of all, were already racist towards Jewish people, right? They didn't even, they thought Jewish people were, were low class, were, were disgusting, were filthy dogs. And then, and then, and now Paul's message is about a Jewish man. So how attractive could that be to a Gentile, right? You, I don't want to learn about a Jewish man. Are you kidding me? This is who your gospel is about? I'm okay. Like, I don't, I don't, I don't want that. I don't need that. That's like... That's okay. That's like, I don't know. That's, uh, yeah. Anyways. 
So this is your so-called God that you're preaching about. This is who your gospel is about. This is who you're teaching about. A God that can die such an embarrassing death. Are you kidding me? So one, you're being mocked and ridiculed by your own people, by Jewish people, right? Um, who think you're living a life of error, that you're in the wrong, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, you're a liar, you've abandoned the true religion, you've abandoned the true faith. And then two, you're being, criti you're being criticized by Gentiles, by non-Jewish people, um, who already view you as a dog and, 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 and less than because of your race, and now your whole faith is founded on a Jewish man. That's just not in any way appealing to them or attractive to them. All right. So it's a lose-lose situation for our poor Paul here. All right? So it's, it's, not, it's not looking too good for him. Um, you know, they just they thought these Christians were troublemakers, had nothing else to do, were trying to stir things up and, and cause havoc. So they were, these were legit reasons, right? These were legit reasons why a Christian would probably be ashamed to spread the gospel of Jesus. Okay? They had, they had a legit reason to be a little fearful and to be ashamed to proclaim the gospel of Christ, of Jesus. And then there's us. Now, in today's age, our present day. Now, do we, do you and I have a legitimate reason to be ashamed of the gospel? That's a tough one. Now, I know it may not be very popular to be a Christian today, but I think, it's, I think it's still pretty cool. I think it's still promoted as a cool thing here and there. Even on TikTok, I see, like, edits of Jesus. You know, it's pretty cool. I don't know, it's just really cool. Like, you know, it makes me, I'm like, yeah, let's go. Yeah, it's okay. So I think there's still, you know, even, even I think people who follow a lot of athletes, right, athletes are still talking about Jesus, which is really cool to see. And so there's still a, a cool aspect of, of, of Christianity. So, you know, we're not as, as, as ridiculed like, like these early Christians were. Um, and Christianity has had its immense impact, right? It has had its impact on, the, on our Western world, right? It's, it's, it's been around for ages. And we're still, there's still a pretty huge population of people who identify themselves as Christians. So it's not like we're a little brand new religion, right? It's, we're, we're global. We're global. Now, is there anybody threatening to arrest us or to kill us for our faith? In this country, no. No. No one, no one is threatening to kill us, uh, to arrest us, to do anything. Because, thankfully, in this country, you still have that freedom of, of your religion. In other countries, though, like Caesar was saying, people don't have that same privilege. People do get killed for being a Christian, for spreading the gospel, right? They, have to, they kind of have to hide their faith. So let's, let's recognize that privilege. However, I understand, I understand that our faith might seem outdated, right? Um, how Western society is trying its hardest to eradicate, to erase Christianity from its roots, all right, and, and our influence from the world. And I understand, I understand how unpopular some of what we believe in now is nowadays um, deemed hateful, right? Well, well we, stuff that we believe in in this faith is seemed hateful. And um, so maybe, maybe you're ashamed. Maybe you're ashamed because you're told that you're hateful or ignorant for believing in this, in this, this gospel here. Um, Maybe you might be ashamed because those around you constantly slander Christianity. Or you just see how much they slander it online. Um, maybe you might be ashamed because maybe you don't know how to defend the faith as well. And you feel like if you do kind of spread it, there will be people who can demolish your faith easily. Or maybe your arguments easily. I don't know. I don't know why. Um, why you personally might be ashamed, but I'm just giving general reasons. Now, to you who suffers from the state of being ashamed, I say to you, let's take on the attitude of Paul. 
Not only was he not ashamed of this gospel, but he was delighted in it. This gospel was his joy. This gospel was his glory. It was his boast. It, he, was, he had so much pride about this gospel of Jesus. In the time where he shouldn't be, maybe, where it wasn't safe to be so, he was still um, not ashamed of the gospel. He, he was unapologetically Christian. That's how we should be. Unapologetically Christian. Unapologetically representing Christ every single day of our life. Do not be ashamed of our Lord, of His story, of His work, of His death, and of His resurrection. Now, let's take a look and let's see why. Why wasn't He ashamed of the gospel? Why was Paul so enamored with it? Why was it his, why was it his glory? Why was it his joy? You know, why was he so, so prideful about it? Why did he glorify himself in it? He says, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. This very gospel, this very gospel, when preached to humanity, when preached to humans, it is enough to save a soul. Does that make sense? If one believes in this gospel of Christ, if one believes in this gospel, they are saved. There is power. There is power. There is power from heaven above. This, this gospel has a little kick to it now, okay? It's a little different, all right? It is divine. It's not man-made. It wasn't, it wasn't authorized by men. It came from God himself. This gospel has power, has divine power, and a power that can only come from God. That when this gospel is proclaimed to the world, and those around can hear the gospel, when, when this is proclaimed, God uses it. God uses this gospel to pierce, to pierce the heart of a non-believer and to make them alive, to open their eyes. He who has ears, let him hear. That's what Jesus would always say when he was preaching. He who has ears, let him hear. Let him hear this beautiful truth that I'm preaching right now. The gospel literally translates into good news. It's good news. It's good news. Why be ashamed of spreading good news to people who need to hear some good news in this life? Right? We're constantly surrounded by, by bad news all the time. Why not give someone some good news? This gospel here that Paul is not ashamed of, it displays God's power at such a high level you're bringing a sinner, you're bringing a sinner who is dead in their own sin, who is, who is only a sinner who can only just, just, they can't do anything else but sin. You're bringing a sinner who is dead in their own sin, who doesn't even know they're a sinner, right? They don't even know they're a sinner. They don't even know that they're in doom, right, of, of condemnation, of judgment from God. And you're revealing to them, you're piercing their hearts, you're piercing their hearts with conviction, with conviction that there is a God, that there is a God in this world. There is a God, and not only, not just any God, there is a God that is holy, that is just, and that thy sinner, that you sinner, are in need of holiness. That's what you're in need of. You're in need of holiness. You're in need of saving. So at one point, at one specific point, you are somebody who doesn't even know, who doesn't even believe that you yourself are a sinner and that you need a savior until one day everything changes. Everything changes and you've been pierced in your heart with the conviction of the Holy Spirit telling you how wicked you truly are, how much of a sinner you really are, how you've wronged your father, your God. And now, and now you recognize that the beauty you recognize the beauty that is Jesus Christ and his cross work. Imagine that one day you have no idea. 
You don't even care. You want nothing to do with God. You want nothing to do with Jesus. You, don't, you get offended at being called a sinner. And then one day something happens and you accept the fact that you are a sinner. And you humble yourself. And you are convicted in this heart of yours that you're in need of saving. I, um, we started Foundations 2 today in the morning. And thankfully, it's a lot of a lot of a lot of students uh, in it. Um, Mateo and Edna are taking it too. It's it's because it's a new course. And uh, if you guys know Mateo, you, I think you guys know his story. And, he, and he's unapologetically, you know, who he is, and 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 he will, he will always take the time to share his testimony. And um, he uh, it always it, uh, I'm surprised I didn't cry there, but just. Seeing how humble he is and always telling his story, he was just saying, um, I just couldn't believe that God would love a sinner like me um, who's, who's, done, who's done so much wrong, you know, who's screwed up all his life, and he calls me his son. You know, I, he's like, I couldn't, I couldn't accept that it was hard for him to accept it because of the life that he came from, and I think we would take it for granted sometimes, you know. And uh, <laughs> it just reminded me of the woman with the alabaster flask who's uh, who's crying at at Jesus' feet, and she's just you know, ah, no, moms. <clears throat> ah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Ah, <sighs> gotta love him. All right. Yeah, and you know, and she's crying at his feet, and she's just anointing his his head, his feet. Well, you know, wiping her tears. You know, I don't know, just just pouring out her love for him. And he's like, those who have been forgiven many, love many. Like you who have been forgiven from so much, you learn to love God that much more. And um, how beautiful is the gospel that at one point you can actually recognize that you are a sinner and that God is here to save you from your sin and from your iniquity. You know, the Holy Spirit has now has made you alive. He's, he's opened your eyes, you know, and you, you, can, you can finally, you can come to his presence, right? You can come to the presence of God. You can be reunited with, with him and you have the ability to cry out, Abba, Father, right? Abba, Padre. You have the ability to call him your father. When at one point, you wouldn't ever even think of doing that. How can you not be proud of this gospel? How can you not delight in this message? A message that brings you salvation. Only a power, only a power so divine can save you from sin, from condemnation, from moral misery and mischief, you know, so on and so forth. Through this gospel here, God is mighty to save. This very own gospel, it reconciles the rebellious, the guilty men to God, the righteous judge and ruler. And most of all, he gives you the, I always say this, the Jews rejected Christ as their Messiah because they thought that the Messiah was going to be here to free them from the oppression of, of, other, of, other, um, of other nations, right? The Jewish at that time, they thought that Christ was going to come and help them murder all the Romans, you know, slay all the Romans and free them. But Christ said there was something else that you need to be free from, and that is your sin, it is death that you need to be free from. Not the Romans, not any other power. It's the power from sin that you need to be free from. That's what the gospel is. Sin is so disgusting. It, 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 it makes you feel like a worthless scum, right? You feel so dirty and guilty, and, and, and the devil uses that so much throughout your walk, right? That you, you start believing like, man, I'm never going to change. You know, how... How can, how can I be in this building right now? But Christ 
tells you that you are free from that sin. And you have to receive it. Okay. Verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So in this gospel that, that Paul is not ashamed of, there is something very important that is revealed to all of humanity, to all of fallen mankind. What is it that is being revealed to us? What does it say? What does it say? For in it what? What is revealed? The righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is being revealed. Remember, this is about God. This is the epistle of God. So the two main themes in this book are God's righteousness and man's sin. Okay? And the first huge, huge important theme that we're seeing here and that we're being introduced to is God's righteousness. God is so holy. He is so perfect. He is good. God literally is what it means to be good. He's righteous. It's logical, it is logical, that a God this holy, that a God this perfect, right, this righteous, it's logical that he can't be united with anything of the opposite, right? Does that make sense? A holy God cannot be united with, with an evil person. Just can't. Which is exactly what we are, right? So how in the world... How in the world does God reconcile a race, a human race, that is unjust, that is wicked, that is sinful, that is evil? How can he do that? Now, some may say to me right now, or maybe thinking in their head, all right, Josh, you know, chill, just chill a little bit. I, I'm, I'm not all those things. You know, I'm, you're trying to paint me as such an awful, you know, an evil person. You know, I'm, when I'm not, you know, I, I do good things. I have a good heart. I'm a, good, I'm a good guy, I'm a good girl, you know, I work, I work for my money, you know, I try to provide for my, and, and to that I say, good job, to that I say, good, good for you, but to you I also say, you fool, I'm just playing, I don't say it, the Bible says that you're a fool, I'm just a messenger, anyone, anyone who calls himself good, anyone who calls himself good, without having God in his or her life, is ignorant, and fools themselves. Not ignorant in, um, in a very, uh, uh, like a bullying kind of way. Ignorant in the fact that you just, they just don't know. They just don't know. You know, and um, I, don't, I don't blame them. I don't blame them for thinking that way. Uh, because in their mind, in their mind, that's the only thing they can believe. Right? And these verses specifically, these verses right here are the recipe in getting right with God. In getting right with God. But it, what is it that they need to get right? What is it that you need to fix? What is it that man has to fix? Well, we have to understand that in, in a, in a non-believer's life, just as you and I were once before, before we came to Christ, before we were called by Christ, we know that they are just not right with God. We know this from the doctrine of original sin, which we will get to later in this book. Before you and I were awakened, before you and I were made alive by the Holy Spirit, you and I were in rebellion against God. Rebeldes. So if we, if we, if you and I were in rebellion, if, if the non-believer is in rebellion, there is no way they can be right with God. Does that make sense? If someone is in rebellion, what does it mean to rebel? To do the exact opposite of what's commanded of you. So if you're doing the exact opposite of what God has commanded you, there's no way you can be right in His eyes. So if you're not made right, then you are to be judged by Him. And it's not only the fact that we're not made right, right? It's not only the fact that we're not right with God. It's also the fact that we're polluted by our own sins. 
Like I just said, I don't blame these non-believers for thinking they're good people without having to believe in God. They haven't been awakened yet by the Spirit. Their hearts haven't received this beautiful gospel yet. So again, I ask, how can mankind, sinful mankind, be reconciled with a heavenly, a holy God? Well, there's nothing you and I can do on our end to fix that. There's nothing that a man could have ever done to fix that. Well, there is one man, actually, that did fix it. There's nothing we can do. But in these verses that we just read, that we just read right now, it says that he, God himself, had to reveal his righteousness to us. He had to communicate his own righteousness. He had to step in and provide to us a righteousness that is exactly what we need. Not only does he... So, if God is the one who reveals, if God is the one who does the revealing, does that mean we can come to it on our own? No, right? You don't discover God's righteousness on your own. He has to reveal it to you. But God doesn't only, it's not like God is, you know, existing, right? And uh, Emilio, you know, I'm, I'm the father, right? Hey, Emilio, look, this is my righteousness. All right, I just wanted to show you, bro. Thank you. I'll carry on. He, it's not like he's just showing you a righteousness, right? It's not like he's just showing, it's, it's not like an art display or a museum exhibit. He says, this is my righteousness. This is what it takes for you to be good. Under my eyes, here, he gives you the righteousness that you need to be made right with God. Does that make sense? He gives us this divine righteousness. He gives us the perfect righteousness. And how do we receive it? By faith. Beautiful. We receive it by faith. It's not by you and I. It's not by you and I doing any righteous deeds or, or, or works ourselves, but by simply having faith that God has given you this righteousness. You are not righteous because of the things that you do. You are righteous because of what you believe has been done for you. Does that make sense? You are not righteous because of the things that you do. You are righteous because of what you believe has already been done for you. The last part of 17, the righteous shall live by faith. By faith. God reveals to us His righteousness so that it allows us to have faith. He is the author of our faith. Of this faith that you and I have, He is the author of it. He is the one who has given us this beautiful faith, this divine faith. And Paul, Paul insists upon the importance and the necessity of faith, how much we need this faith. We are saved by faith alone, through grace alone. You've heard that a lot. But what is it we're putting our faith in? Or who is it that we're putting our faith in? Y'all ever ask someone if, if they believe in God or, or if, like, you know, you ever ask them, like, what they believe in, you know? They're like, oh, I'm not religious, man. I'm just spiritual. I'm just like, what is that? What does that mean? You know? Now, they give their explanation, but it just, it's, it's just, kind of, just kind of vague, you know? It has no, it has no foundation, right? There's no foundation for their spirituality, in a sense. Anyways. Faith, faith is where we start getting more into the spirituality of our faith, of our religion here. Faith is where we start getting more into the spirituality side of our religion here. Faith, faith begins in the heart. Faith begins in the heart. And it works from within, it works from within, outwardly. There is this beautiful, 
There is this spiritual, there is this divine transformation from within that changes us tremendously. This righteousness of God, this, oh, this is perfect, like this holy light, just think of that as like the righteousness of God, right? It's right there. This, this, this righteousness here, it's, um, and this gospel of his, it can, this can only be received by faith. By faith. By true faith. And this righteousness, this righteousness that you and I are living by, that you and I have received, you know whose, you know whose righteousness it is? Christ, Jesus. It's Jesus' righteousness that you are receiving. There are two aspects in regards to Jesus' righteousness, okay? These are very important. First, Jesus as God the Son, Jesus as God the Son is intrinsically righteous already. Him being God, He is already righteous. He is righteousness, right? Because He's God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three in one, they're righteous. They are holy. He is, his substance is righteous. That's one. Christ is righteousness. The Son is righteousness. His very nature is righteous. Which is why he had every right to say in John chapter 8, verse 29, the, the, the latter part of verse 29, he says, while he's on earth, while he's on earth, he says, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Talking about his father, I always do the things that are pleasing to the father, to my father. No, no mere man can say that, right? Just like normally. He means that everything he does, his everyday life, the way he lives it, is pleasing to God the father. He had every right to say that. In that same chapter, in verse 46, he says, he says this so boldly, he asks this question. Which one of you convicts me of sin? He's talking to the Pharisees. They had no answer. They looked stupid. They were speechless. They had, they had no answer. Because Christ knew that they, they, couldn't, they couldn't convict them of any sin. So Jesus as God, God the Son, is utterly holy and without sin. That makes sense? God the Son is holy, no sin. He's already righteous. Good? Now, in the secondary sense of His righteousness, we're looking at Jesus as a man. Because Jesus is what? Fully God and fully man. Jesus as man is also righteous because He achieved a perfect righteousness by his obedience to the law of God while being here on earth. So Jesus, as a man, had to obey the law to the T. To the T. Over 600 written laws. And he had to obey it to the T. And he did just that. Jesus, as man, had to fulfill the law completely, perfectly, and absolutely. Does that make sense? So Jesus the Son, he's holy, he's God, he's holy, he's righteous. Jesus as man had to obey every single law that there is, and he achieved that righteousness. You and I are receivers of this righteousness. That should blow your mind. You and I are receivers of that kind of righteousness. And it's completely free. It's free. It's given to those who are believing in Him. This gospel is the key in showing us how we can be saved. How we can be made right with God. And that is to receive this beautiful gift of righteousness receive this free gift of Christ's righteousness as our own. And you're receiving it by what? Faith. 
You're receiving it by faith. Believe it. Believe it by faith. Now, you keep hearing me say, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. I'm like a broken record. By faith, not by works. I'm sure you've heard that all the time. It's by faith, it's not by works. This verse 17 right here. You know what? If, um, can I call up the worship team? Yeah? Yeah, let me call them up. And then after we'll do the, the offering, and then I'll, I'll come back up to dismiss us. This verse 17 right here is what's referred to sometimes as Martin Luther's text. Everyone, know, everyone hear that, that name before, Martin Luther? He's a, a big church, uh, early church historical figure. He has, he's had a lot of important, uh, he played an important role in, for the Protestants, for us Protestants. This is the very verse, verse 17 right here, that inspired Luther and revealed to him the divine truth and the divine revelation that is God's righteousness and receiving it by faith for our salvation. Now Luther struggled with something that you and I struggle with a lot. Or that some of us tend to struggle when we're beginning our faith in Jesus. When we're beginning our, our walk as Christians. Or maybe some of us still struggle with it. You see, Luther wanted to follow God, and he wanted to obey his law to the T. Luther wanted to be as holy as there is. He studied, and he knew what God required of him. Okay? We, we know we know what God considers good. We know what He considers righteous. We know what He considers wicked, what He considers evil, right? We see it throughout all the Old Testament. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom telling you what is evil and what is good and how you should live. God has revealed to us what He needs of us. It's, it's not some mystery. And so Luther was, was, was consumed, right, was so obsessed with trying to do everything right by his own efforts, on his own, through his own works. But you see, the more that Luther tried to obey the law, tried to obey the law of God to the T, <laughs> the more he tried to do that, the more he failed. The more he tried to remain perfect, the more he found himself failing and sinning. That sucks. That is so frustrating. Trying to be like, God, I just want to obey you, please. I just want to obey you. Oh, I just sinned. Great. Let me start again. He was seeing he was seeing how impossible it was to be perfect like our Heavenly Father is perfect. And it kind of even led Luther to resent God a little bit. He resented God for a while. He resented this idea of a holy judge and a ruler, right, on his throne, ready to, ready to judge the world, right? He, he resented this idea of this God who requires perfection, and who makes it so hard for us to obey him and his every commandment. This holy God who punishes all sinners. It's like as if God was setting us up for failure. Like you're setting me up, God. You know that I'm not perfect and you're requiring me to be perfect. How does that make sense? The math is not math. Make it make sense. Why would you do this to us, God? But then comes Romans 1.17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. In that one verse, faith is written down three times. This is when Luther realized that he misunderstood God's intention in revealing his righteousness to us. 
It wasn't revealed to us so that we can know what's right and wrong. And then like Luther, try our hardest to keep it, you know, uh, to keep it as, as perfect as we could, but in inevitably fail. That's not why God revealed his law to you, for you to try to obey it to the, to the T, because you can't. But it was revealed for a different reason. Christ's righteousness was revealed for a different reason. It was revealed as God's free gift. Free gift. So that you and I, who attempt to do this, can stop trying to be perfect. To stop trying to perfect his law, right? And stop, stop it with our fruitless effort. And instead, rest in Jesus. Rest in Christ's life and in his cross work. The Father sent his only Son to come down, to take on flesh, to live perfectly, to never disobey, to never sin, but being innocent on, on, and holy on this earth. Christ did the hard work for us. He did the impossible for us. He sent him down to fulfill the law, to be the truly only innocent human being, but yet to also take you and I's iniquity, to take all our sin and to put it on him so that his father could give him the punishment that you and I deserve. Christ did all the work. Stop trying to perfect the law. Your Savior did that for you. And you're probably finding yourselves struggling with sin more and more. And yet, and yet you, just, you just go back at it, right? And you're like, all right, let me see. Let me see what I could do differently. Let me see. Okay, maybe. Uh, okay, you know what? I'll wake up. I'll pray. All right, I'll do, I'll do a bit of reading. All right, all right, and then, uh, and then maybe I'll do some, some, some stuff with my, with my friends, with family, you know, and then, and then I think I'll pray at night. All right, cool, cool, let me, let me, let me do it. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that you're not supposed to do that, but don't do it for the wrong reason. Don't do it for the wrong reason. There is nothing else you need to do in order to be obedient. Have faith that Jesus existed, that he lived a perfect life on your behalf, that you are righteous because your Lord is righteous. Have faith that if you believe in him, his spirit will literally transform you and allow you to obey your father. It is through that faith, it is through faith that we have the ability to obey him and to love our God. Have faith that Christ did the work, and all you need to do is rest. All you need to do is trust. All you need to do is live in Him and your nature, your desires, will change and keep being sanctified. You'll get holier as the day comes. And I'm preaching to myself now because for some reason us humans are so stubborn and cabezones at times and we just, we think, some, we think if we do something differently we're going to be better on, you know, and, and then you sin again and you're just like, ah, you know, I just want to flip a table or something and hate myself more. And the more, the more, that, the more that you try to be perfect the more you're going to see how imperfect you are. And you're just going to hate yourself. And when you're thinking that, who's lurking? Who's lurking to see that you're, you know, who's being a little snake? I be in it, right? Like, oh, oh, I got him now. Yeah, yeah. Keep thinking that, boy. Yeah, you're, mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're not worth it. Yeah, andale, ten. You know, 
believe that you're believe that you're filthy, that you're not worthy of any of this. You don't belong here. You don't belong on this altar. Yeah, 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 yeah. Keep saying that to yourself. And we keep saying that. We keep repeating it. And we just keep feeling nasty and dirty and guilty and 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 eventually it leads you to just stop trying at all. And you just stop coming to church. And you stop. I don't know. You just, you just, you just stop. You, you've given up. But it's because we rely on our own efforts. When Paul is saying, "Don't receive it as 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 a job. Receive it by faith. Amen. Trust in your God. As as wicked as you may be, Christ's righteousness is on me right now." Though it's sometimes hard to receive it, I gotta, I gotta live like it. And I gotta, I gotta be, I gotta be proud, and I have to be happy, and I have to stand up with my shoulders back, my chest out, and say, Christ's righteousness is on me. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me.